Hello and welcome to Window to the Soul. In this tutorial series, I will be going through various aspects of tarot to assist your understanding as both reader and querent. Rather than simply running through the basic and well-known interpretations of the cards, it is my intention in this series to give you more, more detail, more depth, and more understanding, and so these tutorials will assume that you already have a basic understanding of tarot and the fundamental meaning of each card. If you would also like to see a beginner's program, please do let me know in the comments and I'll add that to my list. Please note that the meanings and definitions here are intended to accompany and complement, not replace, traditional interpretation. This is one of the many ways that you can expand your knowledge and understanding of tarot. Today we will be taking a deep dive into the minor arcana, which star signs and which planets correspond to each card and why and how that can add an additional layer of meaning for you. The minor arcana, excluding the aces and the court cards, is made up of 36 cards that can be subdivided over the 12 zodiac signs, the 7 traditional planets of astrology and the 4 elements. Wands correspond to the fire signs, Aries, Leo and Sagittarius. Cups correspond to the water signs, Cancer, Scorpio and Pisces. Swords are the air signs, Gemini, Libra and Aquarius, and pentacles would then be the earth signs, Taurus, Virgo and Capricorn. Within the minor arcana, twos, threes and fours relate to the qualities of the cardinal signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra and Capricorn. Fives, sixes and sevens are all fixed signs, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio and Aquarius, and the eights, nines and tens relate to the mutable signs of Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius and Pisces. So the Seven of Swords, for example, is a seven, so it's fixed. It's a sword card and therefore air, so this is fixed air, which is Aquarius. The Seven of Swords is a card of Aquarius. The Three of Wands is Cardinal Fire, and therefore Aries, and the Ten of Pentacles is Mutable Earth and therefore Virgo, but don't worry, I'll go through all of these. In this way, within the Minor Arcana, each star sign has three separate and distinct representations. These are evenly spread and no sign is under or over represented. With this understanding, we can begin to add deeper layers of meaning to each card. Rather than a vague insight that wands are fire, for example, and knowing the fire signs, but trying to put in all of the fire signs in for every wands card, now we're tapering this down and getting specific. We can then go a step further and add even another dimension of awareness when we look at each card's planetary association. There are, of course, even more layers than elements, astrological associations and planetary correspondences, such as elemental expressions, the Kabbalistic worlds encompassed in the Tree of Life, angel associations or archetypical intelligences, seasons, runes and more. But for the purposes of what we're going to look at today, we're going to stick to just these for simplicity and extend these principles in other tutorials on this channel. The planets are a little more complicated, but do feel free to pause on this chart if you need to, and I will go through each card individually and you can make your own notes accordingly. Each minor arcana, numbers 2 through 10, has their own planet, starting with Mars, which represents the Two of Wands, and then moving through the planets in this order, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, the Moon, Saturn and Jupiter. These are the seven traditional planets of astrology. This pattern repeats five times plus one more Mars, which lands on the final decan, which is the Ten of Cups. 
To order these, we move through the zodiac signs in order in sets of three. The first sign is Aries, representing the two, three and four of wands with Mars, the Sun and then Venus. Taurus is the second sign of the zodiac with the five, six and seven of pentacles being Mercury, the Moon and Saturn. The third sign is Gemini, moving from 8, 9 and then 10 with Jupiter, then back to Mars and then the Sun as the cycle continues. This chart shows everything I have explained here, but I will move through each card individually so we can explore together what additional information we can glean from each when we add the element, the star sign and the planet. And we don't even have to commit to memory each individual card when we understand the patterns in play here. We'll start at the beginning with the Two of Wands, which is Cardinal Fire, Aries and the planet Mars. The entire suit of wands relates to fire and the archetypal spiritual world. Fire illuminates and inspires and acts on instinct with an insatiable lust for life. Cardinal energy reflects the beginning, leadership and initiation. The cardinal signs of Aries, Cancer, Libra and Capricorn all spearhead the beginning of a season. Aries kicks off spring, Cancer starts summer, Libra begins fall or autumn and Capricorn is the first winter sign. The Two of Wands is Aries, the beginning, a bold, passionate, assertive sign of the self. Mars is a warrior by nature, ruling over courage, bravery, leadership, physical strength and confidence. So we can look at the Two of Wands, a card of future planning, progress, decisions and discovery, and then add all of these additional layers. The inspiration of fire, the cardinal energy of initiation, the bold and direct approach of Aries, and the courage and confidence of Mars. And now we have something far more multifaceted to work with. The main card's interpretation gives us the what, i.e. planning and progress. But the element, star sign and planet, gives us the how. How is this planning and progress being delivered or expressed in a bold, direct, go get and fire starter fashion? It's also worth bearing in mind that for this particular card, we have a perfect combination in the form of Aries and Mars. Since Mars is the ruling planet of Aries, this only strengthens this card, but a combination as such is certainly not the case for all the minor arcana. In fact, many feature combinations that are in detriment, which can be extremely significant. We'll get to those in due course. The Three of Wands bears many similarities. As with the Two, the Three of Wands is, of course, still fire energy. It's also still a card of Aries, and it's still cardinal. It's only the planet that changes, but that changes so much, and this is why including the planets is, in my opinion, so important. For the Three of Wands, instead of Mars, now we're dealing with the Sun, which lends itself to the seeing and knowing, interpretation of the card. The sun encourages creativity and originality and gives life and energy. It's far less confrontational than Mars and brings a different kind of strength through enlightenment. Knowing the planets plays nicely into card combinations, such as, say, the Seven of Swords, which represents fixed air, the moon in Aquarius. In its natural state, this card deals with what is hidden, as it rests in the light of the moon. However, if a card like this is then clarified, or even next to a sun card like the Three of Wands, the light of the sun trumps the moon, exposing what was hidden for all to see. Card combinations will be the subject of another tutorial on this channel, so we will explore concepts like this in far more detail another time. The Four of Wands, as with the Two and Three, is still Cardinal, still Fire, still Aries, but so much changes now since the planet of Venus 
comes into play. The feminine planet of love soothes and calms all this forceful masculine energy significantly. And of course, now we are very much dealing with love and romance and commitment and connection. But do remember, the cardinal fire and Aries energy is still here. This is still bold, still direct and decisive in matters of love. The Four of Wands is, of course, also a four, bringing in the first of this suit that can truly claim stability and structure. But numerology is for another video lesson on this series. I am aware that I keep referring to other lessons a fair bit here, but I'm sure you can appreciate how interwoven all of this has to be. Tarot is a complex and intricate patchwork quilt. Everything relates to everything else and it's expertly intertwined together. I've had to create separate categories where it was very difficult to do so to bring you all of this. When we reach the five of wands, we change things up seasonally. And so we shift into the fixed signs. For the wands, this is fixed fire, which is Leo. So the five, six and seven of wands are all cards of Leo. The five of wands speaks of conflict, disagreements, competition and tension. And we can understand this better when we know that this is a card with a combination of fixed fire, Leo and the planet Saturn. Saturn is the planet of restriction and limitation. Saturn in this card attempts to enclose and limit all of the fire. The energy and confidence of Leo is stifled and restless, resulting in a negative manifestation. Saturn is a distant planet, making it hard to see eye to eye with others, casting a shadow of control on Leo which is most uncomfortable. Leo prefers to be in the light of the sun, being its ruling astrological body. The Five of Wands is a card in conflict, and that's why it's a card of conflict. The Five of Wands embodies the shadow aspect of Leo, arrogant, prideful, egotistical and selfish. You should pay close attention to the darkness and light from the planets across your entire spread, but especially when clarifying or having a card close to one like the Five of Wands. The Six of Wands is associated with Jupiter, and even though we still have fixed fire and Leo here, this planetary shift changes so much. Here, instead of restricting and limiting the fiery fixed Leo, now we grow and expand this energy into something victorious, something in the spotlight and not without an element of ego, since everything is expanded and magnified with the planet Jupiter. We switch things up again with the Seven of Wands as we return to the beginning of the Seven Planet Cycle to Mars. And when you understand how a combination of fixed fire, Leo and Mars play off on each other, the level of understanding of the Seven of Wands as a card of challenge, competition, defiance and defensiveness deepens significantly. All of the fixed signs, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius and Taurus are just that, fixed and focused. In the case of the Six of Wands, Jupiter strengthens this. With the Five of Wands, Saturn closes it in, restricting, rigid and stubborn. And then for the Seven, Mars brings the fight and the energy of defending what you believe in. Moving on to Mutable Fire then with cards 8, 9 and 10. These are all cards of Sagittarius. The 8 is Mercury, the planet of communication. The 9 is the Moon, placing Sagittarius's Mutable Fire in its shadow aspect. And the 10 is Saturn, restricting and limiting Saturn's mutable quality. Remember, the card's basic interpretation is the what. For the 8 of Wands, this is communication, action, travel and movement. Everything we are looking at here tells us the motivation behind this, however, the how. All of this movement is being communicated in the Eight of Wands within the energy of mutable fire, Sagittarius and the planet Mercury. 
Mutable signs are flexible. They can easily navigate change and transition. They are extremely adaptable. This is like talking to someone extremely persuasive or someone that seems to have an answer for everything. Fire signs are bold, fun and impulsive and adventurous. You can perhaps expect this conversation to have a few laughs. Now we not only see that the eight of wands means someone wants to talk, but we understand how they will approach this and what motivates said communication. The Eight of Wands is an overt card of communication, even if you were not aware that its ruling planet is Mercury. But it is worth remembering that there are other cards associated with Mercury and you can bring in communication, thought or intellect into the card's meaning when you pull these. These cards would be the Magician, the Lovers and the Hermit, believe it or not, but that's for a major arcana video. In terms of minors, the Mercury cards are the Eight of Wands, the Six of Swords, the Five of Pentacles, the Three of Cups and the Ten of Pentacles. Some of these are in detriment and the nature of communication therefore differs and can even be stifled, leaving a yearning to speak, but perhaps the inability to express yourself. They can also speak of thoughts running through the mind. I think by now you get the idea of how the cardinal, fixed or mutable qualities plus the sign plus the planet changes things dramatically. I will continue to run through the rest of the minors, but from here on in, I'll only add things for each card where I believe it is noteworthy and not necessarily obvious. Moving on to the cups then, starting with the two, back to the cardinal signs. Cups are water, so the two of cups is cardinal water, which is the sign of cancer. In its light aspect, cancer is nurturing, giving, supportive and emotionally stable. In its shadow aspect, cancer is overly emotional, emotionally manipulative, possessive and jealous. The two of cups is cardinal water cancer in Venus. A light aspect, bringing the love, care and consideration. The Three of Cups is Cardinal Water Cancer in Mercury, communicating the wonderful qualities of a Cancer. Threes are group dynamics, and with Cancer, this is your family, your friends, your loved ones. Very different to say the Three of Pentacles, which is Capricorn, and therefore more likely to be work orientated, your boss, your work colleagues, etc. Again, numerology will be covered in a separate tutorial, but all of these lessons very much relate to one another. The Four of Cups is Cardinal Water Cancer in the Moon, instantly plunging the energy here into its shadow aspect. Quite a dramatic change in meaning, a rejection of what is loving and nurturing. The Five, Six and Seven of Cups are all fixed water, which is Scorpio. Scorpio is a sign of depth loyalty, ambition in its light aspect, but secretive, manipulative, resentful and jealous in the dark. The Five of Cups is therefore fixed water Scorpio, but in Mars, at war, in conflict, violently tormented by all the shadow aspects of Scorpio. The Six of Cups is fixed water Scorpio in the sun, shedding light and bringing energy to something deeper, more spiritual, more meaningful. The Seven of Cups is fixed water Scorpio in Venus. To get an extended sense of each of these, you can try researching extended explanations of these combinations to get far more than what I'm able to express in this video. Cafeastrology.com, for example, will tell you that Venus in Scorpio speaks of possessiveness, the energy of getting below the surface value of something and a fear of being vulnerable, which gives us far greater understanding of the Seven of Cups beyond the obvious interpretation of choices. The Eight, Nine and Ten of Cups are all mutable water Pisces, creative, full of empathy and generous of spirit, but potentially impressionable, closed off and overly emotional. The Eight of Cups is mutable water Pisces in Saturn, restricting the generosity, restricting the empathy of Pisces and restricting the mutable quality, making the energy rigid and unforgiving. 
The Nine of Cups is mutable water Pisces in Jupiter, expanding all that is Pisces with a focus on the self, since this is a nine. The Ten of Cups is mutable water Pisces in the planet of love, Venus, and no wonder, since the Ten of Cups is our card of bliss and love, our beautiful happily ever after card. Now, the swords are a notoriously challenging suit. The Two of Swords is Cardinal Air. Cardinal Air is Libra, and the sign of the scales and balance is very much related in this card, although this card's planet is the moon. Note that the moon quite literally features on this card. With the moon, Libra is cast into its shadow aspect, out of balance and indecisive. And don't worry about the aces, by the way, we'll cover those again in another video. The Three of Swords is Cardinal Air Libra in Saturn, restricting all that is trying to positively manifest with Libra. This is an energy that is unfair, unjust, and lacking in harmony. The Four of Swords is Cardinal Air Libra in Jupiter, and what a relief. Now we can find the time to think and make decisions and rediscover our flow and balance. Moving to the five, six and seven then, we are now dealing with fixed air, which is Aquarius, assertive, original, independent and humanitarian. The five of swords, however, is fixed air in Aquarius in Venus, which reflects a love of the self and self-respect, magnifying the defiance of Aquarius, often not doing what others may want or hope, going their own way, not playing the game which sheds some light on which of the characters in this card we should perhaps be paying attention to. Maybe we shouldn't be looking at the person in the foreground, but instead the people walking away, the people refusing to engage. If someone is using sharp words and trying to win, it would be very characteristic of an Aquarius to simply choose not to play this game. Unlike, say, Leo. In the Five of Wands, who may secretly love getting involved in the drama, Aquarius would simply turn their attention to something they do love, something else that brings them the joy that Venus represents in search of something on the same intellectual page. The Six of Swords is fixed air, Aquarius in Mercury, that independent energy of refusing to engage in something that is not for you, even something you perceive to be beneath you, perhaps. The energy is still there, but Mercury brings the potential for communicating this truth, or at the very least, dwelling on it in the mind. Pay careful attention to the cards clarifying and around any Aquarius card. This includes the star in the Major Arcana, as Aquarius is a sign that can speak of what is unconventional, unique and unexpected. All the Aquarius cards seem to be guided towards something else, but in a rather different way. The Seven of Swords is an infamous card, fixed air, Aquarius, in the shadow of the moon, cold, detached, deceptive, aloof, inconsistent and hard to reach emotionally, which speaks volumes regarding the lack of empathy you might expect from a person this card may represent. The Eight, Nine and Ten of Swords are then mutable air, Gemini, mercurial, intellectual, of the mind and spontaneous, but also potentially unreliable, flighty, indecisive and overthinking. The Eight of Swords is mutable air Gemini in Jupiter, but this is a card of self-imposed restriction, imprisonment and victim mentality, I hear you cry, and Jupiter is good luck and expansion. How can this be? Well, Gemini is known to be objective, curious and multifaceted, while Jupiter deals in absolutes, and this conflict can lead to a paralysis of sorts, of both the mind and the body. Jupiter pushes Gemini energy to think deeply and focus their attention, which can lead to burnout and be overwhelming for Gemini energy. This is not the crossroads of, say, the Two of Swords level of indecisiveness. This is a tangle of paths, full of a confusing array of mazes and shortcuts, bridges, dead ends and underground passages, 
from a positive point of view. We can see a person pulling this card as confused and stranded, yes, overthinking and overwhelmed. But we can also predict a glimmer of hope in the form of eventually figuring out this complex problem after a period of necessary and deep reflection and thought. The Nine of Swords is another challenging card, mutable air, Gemini in Mars. Strange how Gemini is known for being quick-witted and having a great sense of humour, and yet seems to carry the weight of such heavy cards. Unless you're a Gemini, however. You might not fully understand what goes on up there in the mind of the twins. With the Nine of Swords being a card of Mars, now we are at war with the internal thoughts, a struggle of the mind and with the self. Geminis need truth and clarity. They need to communicate and they need to be communicated with. In the absence of these things, they become anxious, nervous and restless. The Ten of Swords is another strange one, so bear with me. This is, of course, a card of pain betrayal, humiliation, being backstabbed, and a painful ending. But this card carries the energy of mutable air, Gemini, and the sun, calling us then to pay careful attention and consideration to that literal sun rising in the background of this card. As readers, perhaps it is that which we should be truly focusing on when we pull this card. The sun is rising, a new day is dawning, there is hope on the horizon, the damage has been done, things can only get better from here. This is, after all, a 10, which indicates the end of all of this negative energy. Finally, we move to the pentacles, or in some suits, the discs or the coins, and back to the cardinal signs for one more round, and in this case, that would be Capricorn. The Two of Pentacles is Cardinal Earth, Capricorn in Jupiter, expanding and growing that hard-working, dedicated ethic we would expect from a Capricorn. The Three of Pentacles is Cardinal Earth, Capricorn in Mars. There is, of course, cooperation and collaboration here since this is a three, but you can rest assured with all of this Mars energy present that a significant someone is taking a leadership role here. The Four of Pentacles is Cardinal Earth in the Sun. Capricorns like to save money. They are cautious and conservative and they enjoy security and being in control of their circumstances. This card is Capricorn in the light of the Sun, being unapologetically Capricorn. The Five, Six and Seven of Pentacles are Fixed Earth. Hello, Taurus. The Five of Pentacles would then be Fixed Earth Taurus in Mercury. We know Mercury is the planet of communication, but the sign of Taurus are not natural communicators in the way, say, a Gemini would be. Taurus can be straight talking and to the point. Some may appreciate this. Others may find this abrasive, cold and lacking in compassion. When Mercury is in Taurus, information is processed and then either accepted or rejected in a kind of screening process. This can often leave people feeling left out in the cold and not fully understanding why. The Six of Pentacles is fixed Earth Taurus in the Moon, moving us deep into the shadow aspect of Taurus. Understanding this must lead us to question how it is we understand this card. Is this an image of sharing and balance? Or is there a significant imbalance shown in this card? Could this be breadcrumbing and greed? A person that could give so much more and yet chooses to only give a little and then wants to feel that they have been kind and generous and benevolent. If we think of the word altruism, this is not an image of that. This is an image of giving and receiving, yes. But could we interpret this as someone offering breadcrumbs and expecting the receiver to respond as if they were being served a gourmet meal? The moon is exalted in Taurus, responsive rather than active, conservative about change and passive and immovable. 
This is a card of security. The wealthy character here would never give what they considered to be too much, and the share will never be equal here. The Seven of Pentacles is fixed Earth Taurus in Saturn, loyal, cautious, and seeking security, asking, is this enough? Did you put enough effort in? Did you spend enough time on this? Saturn gives us a clear picture of where we stand, and we can now see the rewards of our efforts with this card. The question is, are we satisfied with these rewards? We sowed a seed back at the Ace, but was this seed nurtured? Did we give this seed enough sunlight and water? Was it enough? The fact we are questioning this suggests perhaps not. The final set of pentacles, 8, 9 and 10, all relate to mutable earth, which would be Virgo. The 8 being mutable earth in Virgo in all the light of the sun, shining a bright light on everything that is Virgo, meticulous, hard-working, consistent, dedicated and detail orientated. The Nine of Pentacles is Mutable Earth, Virgo in Venus. So this is a Nine card, so it's a card of the self and a card of coming to the end, nearing completion and assessing all that we have achieved for ourselves. And since we're in Venus, the outlook is good. We love ourselves. We're proud of what it is we have achieved. We are assured, confident and secure. We don't need anyone or even anything else. The Ten of Pentacles is mutable Earth Virgo in Mercury, ready to communicate the success of Virgo, ready to share these thoughts and ideals and achievements with others. Not flashy, but detail-orientated, practical and organised. The bills are paid on time, the environment is organised, everyone is provided for and plans are being adhered to. This is being willing and ready to listen and to communicate and to be supportive of the self and of others. Creating this sense of structure and stability is how love is being shown for the family and loved ones. And there we have it. That is all of the star sign and planetary correspondences for the Minor Arcana. You may be wondering about the court cards of each suit, but they are a whole separate beast and will be the subject of the next video in this series. The Aces have no planetary associations and represents the will and force of all of the signs of the corresponding element. The Ace of Swords, for example, is Libra, Aquarius and Gemini. When we explore numerology, the aces will be addressed in far more detail. Thank you for watching. I do hope that you got something from this. I worked very hard on this presentation. I am open to suggestions for further tutorials, so please do let me know what you would like to know more about, what it is you would like to explore, and if you have any questions that I can address further down the line. Drop your thoughts in the comments section and make sure you are subscribed to receive more lessons like this coming soon.